Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour back in our Father's Word, chapter 21, the great book of Luke. Now, Christ has taught in the last couple of three chapters that he's going away and that there will be a second advent. And he prepared us how to, to deal with non-believers and with the enemy and uh, other peoples. In the very last chapter, he dealt with questions from uh, religious, civil, and domestic, how, how you should deal with it. Now he tells us how to deal with the Antichrist and the end times, exactly how it's going to be. This is a beautiful thing that he gives us, whereby there is no unknown factors. And basically, when you know what's going down, you know how to prepare for it. That's what this 21st chapter is all about. It's a lot like the 24th chapter of Matthew and Mark 13, only where they hit it straight on, this moves over and gives you a side profile shot, gives you a little different angle whereby by putting them all together, you have a beautiful picture. Chapter 21, uh, the great book of Luke, the light giver, verse one, and it reads, and he looked up and he saw the rich men casting their gifts into the treasury. Verse two, and he saw also a certain poor widow casting in thither two mites. Verse three, and he said, of a truth, I say unto you that this poor widow hath cast in more than they all. Why? Because all of them put together, why? Well, it's all she had. They were just doing a regular tithe. She put in everything she had. Verse four, the reason being, verse four, for all these have of their abundance cast in unto the offerings of God, the tithe, but she of her plenary, her, in her um, low funds, hath cast in all the living that she had. In other words, she opened her heart, she loved God, she trusted God, and there it was. This, this was very pleasing, but it sets a very good stage for what he's going to do for his people that wait on him, that are not pulled aside by false teaching, false leadership, <clears throat> but give all to the true Father, to the true Son and Holy Spirit. That is to say, those that cannot be deceived. Why? Because they understand our Father's Word. How, what keeps you from being deceived? Not man, but God's Word. <clears throat> Verse 5, to continue. And as some spake of the temple, how it was adorned with goodly stones and gifts. He said, verse 6, as for these things which you behold, the days will come in the which there shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now, don't ever let man deceive you. A lot of, a lot of your so-called um, teachers would tell you, well, this happened in 70 AD when the Roman general Titus came marching in and took the city. Not so. Why? But this, this is the Antichrist coming as it is written in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 to sit in the temple of God. The great tribulation that is of the false one. That's what it's talking about. <clears throat> and we still have the wailing wall standing to this day. Those stones have never been thrown down. And uh, you see people worshiping there at the Wailing Wall or the West Wall, whatever you want to call it. But there is a time coming when Christ's feet touch down on the Mount of Olives that after the Antichrist has set up camp there, he's going to level it. He's going to declare and prepare it for the Millennium Temple which, which uh, definitely will come to pass. Hasn't happened yet, so don't you let somebody tell you that some little 
uh, Roman general Titus uh, accomplished what's about to happen. He didn't. It's yet future, most of it. <clears throat> Excuse me, verse 7. And they asked him, saying, Master, but when shall these things be? And what sign shall there be, give, be when these things shall come to pass? What should we look for? What is our signal? Now, this is really given just a little better in Matthew 24. I kind of told you that this is likened to Matthew 24. Listen to what they ask in totality. Verse 3 of Matthew 24, And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming? This means the second advent and of the end of the world. That's the most asked question. When will the end of the world be? He's going to tell you. He's going to tell you the signs that will be present at that event. And that's why this becomes super important to God's election for it directly connects to and concerns God's elect because they have a part in it. And then we return to the 21st chapter of the great book of Luke, and what we're looking for is signs and events that will transpire. Watch it carefully. Verse 8, And he said, Take heed that you be not deceived. That's, that's the first warning. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ. And the time, and the time draweth near, Go ye not therefore after them. Don't you believe it? What he's saying here, there will be many that will come claiming to be a Christian preacher, saying you go here and you fly there and you fly away here and fly away there. And don't you go with them. Don't believe it. Well, what signs should we look for then? Well, let's, let's check it out. He's not, he's not uh, hiding this from us. He's teaching it openly. Verse 9, And when you shall hear of wars and commotions, be not terrified, for these things must first come to pass, but the end is not by and by. And by and by means immediately. It's not, it's not that soon. Well, then, as long as you hear of wars and rumors of wars, well, we've got Afghanistan, we've got Iraq, Got a few other things. What, what is the opposite? We have Lebanon, we have Israel, the Israelis. What, what is the opposite of wars and rumors of wars? World peace. When they cry peace, 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 that's a sign you do not want to overlook. I'll say it again. As long as you have wars and rumors of wars, it's not instant, it's not real soon. But when you start hearing peace, 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 then you better get your ears on, get your head out of the sand. You're a watchman. You're supposed to watch. That's one of the signs. It's real easy. You can't miss that one. Verse 10, Then said he unto them, Nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. You're, you're going to have these troubles. Verse 11, and great earthquakes shall be in diverse places, and famines, and pestilence, and fearful sights, uh, and great signs shall there be from where? From, where? Where will these signs be from? From heaven. Well, what's it going to be from heaven? Satan's going to be cast out. That's a sign you better not miss. Well, you mean it's not going to be on earth? Well, he's coming to earth, but the sign will originally come from heaven, and you'd better be watching. That means the supernatural is coming. Well, what, what, about, um, what, what about the famine? What, what is this famine of the end times? You're not going to have it. I'm going to read it to you. Amos chapter 8, verse 11. Behold, the days come saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land. This is the famine we're talking about. Not a famine of bread, nor of thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. 
In other words, God's Word taught chapter by chapter and verse by verse, whereby people have an understanding of what's about to transpire. The signs of the season bringing you, when you see those signs into the season, that announces the arrival soon, not only of the wicked one, but of Christ himself, the second advent. That's what this builds toward. So that famine is, um, you might say, well, when, when churches are saying, well, we're losing attendance, things are going, well, well, teach God's word then. Let the words of God be taught chapter by chapter and verse by verse, whereby it is God's word that is taught, not some man's. And then your church will grow you will have a tendency that probably you can't even take care of. Those are the signs that you want to be aware of. Now returning to the 21st chapter, let's go with the next verse, 12. But before all these, uh-oh, this is what we we'll to be careful of. They shall lay their hands on you. I, I said you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and unto prisons, being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. And there, for what purpose was that? For Christ's name's sake. Now, uh, do you remember when we were back in the 12th chapter of this great book, I told you to remember that 10th verse in that 12th chapter that I would be calling your attention to it again. The unforgivable sin is for God's elect when they're delivered up before the synagogue of Satan, the Antichrist, that the Holy Spirit would speak through you. And we read there in the 10th, the 12th chapter of the, the same book of Luke, and I told you to remember, to remember these verses, verse 9, and he that denieth me before men shall be denied before the angels of God, being the unpardonable sin. And whosoever, verse 10, shall speak a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. That is, as Christ walking in the flesh on earth, that's forgivable. But unto him that blasphemeth against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven. Well, how does that come to pass? 11, and when they bring you unto the synagogues, that's the synagogue of Satan now, and unto magistrates and powers take ye no thought how or what thing you shall answer or what you shall say. Well, why wouldn't you think? Because, listen, Verse 12, for the Holy Spirit shall teach you in the same hour, that's the hour of temptation, what you ought to say. In other words, God wants to speak through you. If as one of God's elect and only they can commit the unpardonable sin because God's not going to speak through somebody that's a non-believer. He speaks through those that do know, the under, that understands this Word of God, the signs of that uh, are present and how they are to react. But that is the unpardonable sin and it can only be committed after the false Christ appears on earth when one of God's elect refuses the Holy Spirit the opportunity to speak through them. It will not happen, I assure you. God's elect are ready for action. They are ready to perform in the service of the King. Returning then to the 21st chapter of this great book of Luke, let's pick it up with verse 13. Listen carefully. And it shall turn to you. It's going to turn to who? It's going to turn to you for a testimony. Not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit speaking through you right against Satan. I mean, going for the juggler of the old, old uh, devil himself. What an opportunity to live and to serve God. And when is this going to happen? He told you. Gave you the sign. It's coming from heaven. 14, listen carefully. Settle it, therefore, in your hearts. That's in your mind. Not to meditate before what you shall answer. Don't you even think about it. You're not the one that's going to be the, doing the talking. How come? Verse 15, for I will give you a mouth 
and wisdom which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay nor resist. They can't, have, they can't gain one thing against what you say. Why? Well, it's not you speaking. It's the Holy Spirit. God's going to give you that wisdom. Do you know what this is? This is the Pentecostal tongue spoken on Pentecost Day when Christ resurrected 40 days and then 10 days later the Holy Spirit showed up. Acts chapter 2, verse 6 and 7, where they didn't speak in an unknown tongue. That's not the Pentecost tongue. The tongue on Pentecost was known, quite the opposite of unknown, but known by everyone. Because that is the presence of the Holy Spirit, and Peter himself would say, this is that that was spoken of by Joel the prophet. So if you want to know what they were saying, all you've got to do is go to chapter 2, the great book of Joel. And you find out that it is both the sons and the daughters of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Almighty God that is to say, as they are delivered up, uh, that the Holy Spirit speaks through them as a, for a testimony to the whole world about events that are transpiring and who this false one that they're delivered up before is, that is none other than Satan himself playing the role of Christ, which means Antichrist. We have many movies and so forth put together showing the Antichrist as some vile, multi-headed, wicked, horned monster. Boy, is that going to deceive a lot of people because it is none other than Satan himself and he's the most beautiful cherubim ever created. God himself stating it in Ezekiel 28. Looking just like people think Christ looks like. And from his mouth comes the word that he is Christ. And all those that follow him will certainly wake up. I mean, good Christians that were not taught properly, worshiping Satan at the very last minute of this earth age, before the millennium, and then to wake up and realize when the true Christ returns that they've been in bed with Satan himself. What a letdown. It's no wonder they pray for the mountains to fall on them. They're too ashamed to face the Lord Jesus Christ who died for them and taught them, gave them the signs, told them exactly how it was going to go down where they would not be deceived. And then they have them end up in bed with Satan. It's going to happen because people listen to malarkey rather than the Word of God. The famine in these end times is not for bread, nor for water, but for hearing the words of God. It will get you in much trouble. So um, this is what you want to settle in your mind. Well, I'm not a real great speaker. Well, you're not the one that's going to be doing the speaking. You got to get that through your mind. It is God himself that uses your uh, very mouth to speak the words by the Holy Spirit that will convert many, many people. What a time to live, and you're living it. Verse 16 to continue in the great 21st chapter, and, and it reads, And you shall be betrayed both by parents and brethren and kinfolks and friends, and some of you shall they cause to be put to death. Now, now understand what put to death means. Let's translate it properly. Who is death? Well, let's document it. Let the Word of God document it for you so you're not deceived. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. Christ came to this earth in the flesh to be crucified, whereby he could destroy death, which is to say the devil. That's Satan's name is death. He's a dead man walking. Therefore, how precious it is that um, you are delivered up before him whereby God can speak through you to let the world know who he truly is and what a fake he is. Uh, you're not to me premeditate what you'll speak, and I'm certainly not putting words in your mouth, but God intends to, and he will put words in your mouth. Well, why, why would a parent betray a child to up to before the devil because they think he's Christ 
I mean, they're good Christian people, they think. They probably go to church all the time, but they're never taught there. Maybe they got one verse, Charlie, that gives one verse and then goes on with his own thoughts for an hour. And, but we never taught this Luke 21 or Matthew 24 or Mark 13 or many other passages from God's Word whereby they would know the truth, whereby they could stand. So therefore, they believe He is Christ and they love you, so they're going to go right to the devil and say, thinking He is Christ, my daughter is a beautiful child. She really, she thinks she's serving you. But indeed, she thinks you are the false Christ. And you know what he will say? Well, bring her own in and let's convert her. You see, that's what Satan will be running, playing Jesus. And he will be running the greatest church there and, and greatest revival there has ever been, known to man on this earth not wars by guns or anything of that nature or witchcraft, but by religion, only it's false religion. It is Satan himself claiming to be Christ. And, and naturally, a, a, a relative who thinks he is Christ, thinks they're doing you a favor when they deliver you up to him, begging for mercy from him, for your soul, when God already has your soul protected. That's why parents will betray and kin folks, others, for religious reasons. You don't have to go very far to know and see the real truth in that matter of what kin folks will do in the name of religion. Verse 17 to continue. And you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. Why will you be hated? Let it be for only one reason, beloved, his namesake. You stay with him. You stay true to him. It does not matter if, uh, if the whole world hates you and God loves you, you're in good shape because you and he make a majority. Verse 18, but there shall not be an hair of your head perish. How much faith do you have? It said, that verse said, not one hair on your head shall perish. As it is written concerning Satan's trip to this earth in Revelation chapter 9, verse 4, God telling him, don't you dare touch one of mine that have the seal of God in their forehead, meaning the truth of God's word in their mind where it has settled there. You can't touch them. You can't tempt them. Well, we're too smart for him. We know who he is. We've got his M.O. We have his number. And so it is. But God protects the elect. Let your faith strengthen. Let your knowledge be known and settled in your heart and mind. Through this ordeal of witnessing before Antichrist, God will take care of you. Even the adversaries will be convinced by what you say. Think about it. What a time to live. What a precious moment that will be. Verse 19. <clears throat> in your presence, I'm sorry, in your patience, possess ye your souls. That's it. Well, what is patience? You wait. You wait for the true Christ. Don't you fall off and be deceived by the fake. If they tell you he's over here or he's over there, don't you believe it? As long as you're in a flesh body, the seventh trump hasn't sounded, and the true Christ has not returned to this earth. <clears throat> Your soul being patient brings you to that moment whereby you have that victory and God uses you. It turns to you, and you don't want to let him down. Think about it. Let your faith be strong. Not one hair can be touched on your head. Uh, verse 20, to continue. And when you shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, here's another sign, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. This is the desolation of abomination spoken of by Daniel the prophet, as it would be written in the 24th chapter of Matthew and 13th chapter of Mark. And what it means is, is the desolator, not desolation, 
but the desolator, which is Satan himself, stands in that place. Kind of his little army as he maneuvers them, moves them. 21, then let them which are in Judea, this gives you the geographical location, flee to the mountains and let them which are in the midst of it or her depart out. And let not them that are in the countries enter thereunto. Why? It's over. It's going down. <clears throat> Christ is about, what was the question? Don't you forget. You keep this all wired together in your mind. The question was, there won't be one stone left standing atop another. Where do you want to be when that happens? You don't want to be there. God will take care of his own. You have nothing to worry about. Verse 22. For these, must, for these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. You got that? Every last thing for give, for, fulfilled in the generation of the fig tree. Now, we were, we were back in the, uh, when, when we were teaching in the fourth chapter, I told you to remember something. When Christ went into the temple and he picked up the scroll of Isaiah in chapter 4, verse 18, I ask you to remember that. I said, I'm going to call it to your attention again. This is where I'm going to do it in relationship to the day of vengeance, okay? Christ walked into the temple. He picked up the book of Isaiah, chapter 4, verse 18 of this same book, the book of Luke. The Spirit, this is what he read to the congregation. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, he has, <clears throat> he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to um, preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, verse 19, listen carefully, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord, period. He closed it. That's not the end of the sentence. There's, a, there's another part to that sentence. Well, why couldn't he read it then? Because it wasn't time. Listen, and he closed the book and he gave it again to the minister, sat down and the eyes of all looked at him, and then he would say, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. What? The first part. Well, what, what is the, um, what was the second part of that uh, very verse? It was 16 of Isaiah. That's what he was reading. And that's why it's important, you need to know it, because all things are going to be fulfilled within that. And here we go, verse 2 of chapter 61, the great book of Isaiah, and it reads, To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn. That's what he did not finish. I'll read the first part again, verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and to the opening of the prison to them that are bound. And here it comes to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Instead of period, it's comma, finish the sentence, and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn and rejoice, O Zion. So, you see, the day of vengeance is coming, but it would, there's a gap there. It would not happen until the second had been, and that's why he could not say, this day has this prophecy come to pass, because the day of vengeance hadn't. It has not yet come to pass. But I, you can rest assured it shall come to pass, and don't let any of these clues of the signs of the nearing of our Heavenly Father escape you, for all that is written may be fulfilled when these things are seen. Returning to Luke 21, verse 23, it reads, But woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days, for there shall be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people. 
the ones that are deceived. Now, there is no sin in a mother carrying a child in her womb. That's a blessing. So what's he talking about? Well, how long has Christ been away? Well, over 2,000 years. And he, what does he expect to find when he returns? A virgin bride. Now, if he returns back and you have been spiritually, not physically, but spiritually impregnated by the teachings of the false Christ and have been impregnated by him and are even nursing along, giving thought, nursing along his work, helping Satan, can you imagine that? A Christian actually impregnated spiritually and helping Satan's work what kind of light does that leave them in in God's eyes? He's jealous. And, and the reason he uses this analogy is if you were gone for several years and you came back and your mate was uh, uh, the father or mother of a, a suckling babe, how would you feel about it? He says, that's the way I feel. I'm jealous. I don't want you messing with Satan. I want you to wait for me. You want to take, you want to be a virgin in that um, wedding, you better listen up because he's making it very clear what he expects. Again, I want to double emphasize, it's a blessing for a mother to carry a child in her womb. This is speaking of a spiritual impregnation by the false one. Verse 24, and they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. And so it will be. I do not have to tell you who controls the Dome of the Rock and how that that prophecy continues on and will until this day, until that second advent, it shall come to pass. You're living in a perilous time. Many of these things are formulating right now before our very eyes. And many would say, well, men have taught the end of the world since the beginning of time. Well, the thing, the clue that God's Word states sets the end generation is Israel beginning, becoming a nation again. That happened in 1948. Many of us witnessed it. So there's no, no excuse for not being able to understand the simplicity in which Almighty God brings us the events of the end times whereby a watchman has the knowledge to know what he's watching for or she's watching for, whereby they are not deceived by Satan or man because both will deceive you if they have the opportunity how do you stop the deception? It was the first warning. See that man does not deceive you. How do I prevent that? Stick to God's Word, His Word only, as it is taught chapter by chapter and verse by verse. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please? The Strong's Exhaustive Concordance of the Bible is an invaluable tool to the serious Bible student. The Strong's Concordance lists every word used in the Bible and every passage where the word utilized may be found in the scriptures. With the assistance of a reference numbering system, the English reader may easily translate any word back to the original Hebrew, Chaldee, or Greek in which God's word was written. The Companion Bible is a unique study Bible. In addition to the text of the King James Version Bible, an extra wide margin contains a wealth of information not found in other Bibles. A system of structures or outlines employed by the Companion Bible will allow the readers to rightly divide the Bible. The use of these structures help the reader follow the subject matter and therefore they are critical to an understanding of God's Word. The 198 appendixes found in the Bible cover a wide variety of topics and information which will enlighten your studies. The Companion Bible and Strongest Concordance are a must for the serious Bible student. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the spirit moves and you have a question, you share it. Won't you do that? Please never ask a question about a particular reverend or denomination or organization. We do not judge people. We have one judge. It's our Father. 
He doesn't need our help. He's quite capable of taking care of business. He always does. But you do have the right and the gift from God called spiritual discernment as to who you should listen to, who you should follow. I hope that your discernment always lets you settle on God's Word. That that's what you should listen to, God's Word. He wrote us the letter whereby we would not be deceived. You want to always thank Him uh, for that. Those of you that listen by short wave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you and your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Again, always a pleasure. Got a prayer request? Don't need that number. You don't need an address. Why? God knows what you're thinking right now. Why? He loves you. What He wants from you more than anything else is that love returned. He wants you to love Him. That's uh, Hosea 6.6. 6. I don't want your burnt offerings. I want your grace, your mercy, your love. That's what He wants from you. Return it and be blessed. Father, Around the globe we come. We ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father. Touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, question time. We're going to go with uh, Caitlin from Georgia. Uh, my, I am 11 years old and I live in Georgia. I watch your show program every day. My question is, when and where will Satan be cast down? Thank you very much. Well, you're very welcome. We don't know the exact point, like today we were learning some signs, but we do know the location. He's going to be cast down to Judea. And as it is written in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4, he's going to set his throne on Mount Zion. Uh, right, uh, naturally, he's mimicking or following Christ. Regina from Georgia. When Noah brought two of every flesh aboard the ark, is it possible that he included two of the hybrid giants? There is written, there is nothing written about the second influx that I have found to explain the existence of Og. Yes, yes there is. You, if you have a, a companion Bible, I'll make it real easy for you. Appendix 25, it tells you of the second influx. Uh, but um, he naturally did not take two of them aboard because that was the purpose of the flood, was to destroy them. And so it was. Um, uh, Christina, Christian, Christine from Georgia. My name is Christine. I'm 17 years old and I am from Georgia. And um, I have been wondering what Isaiah 40, 31 means. What does it mean when it says to wait upon the Lord? But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings of, as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. It means to wait for the true Christ. Don't be sucked in by the fake. Okay. Wait on Him. That's one of God's elect. He will give you the power, the strength, the knowledge, a mouth of wisdom as we were teaching today. It is so precious. Don't be that first one taken in the field that's taken by Antichrist. Wait for the true Lord. Let the Lord use you. Okay, Nanny from Ohio. I want to know if not I'll put it on if not I'll put it on the shelf until the time for me to know. The question, what was the woman's name who was a teacher and I think she taught at a school. Thank you all you do and the people there at the, at the uh, chapel. Well, you are so very welcome. Her name was Hulda, Hulda. And you will find it reported in 2 Kings chapter 22, verse 14. She was over the college. And um, the king, uh, the leader was, went uh, during the reign of Josiah. And um, they went to her to find out what God had to say. God uses both sons and daughters. Always has, he always will. Holda was her name. Um, Anwan, Anwan from Mississippi. What did Satan, why did Satan tempt Christ in the wilderness? Did he not know Jesus was the God in the flesh? He, he thinks he's better even than God. And many people might say, well, I cannot understand why he thinks he's better, because the whole world follows him. I mean, there, most, the majority of the world does everything but worship him. 
I mean, they follow him. They follow the prince of darkness and the things that he puts upon this world and become a part of it. He's got the whole world, except for God's election, basically eating out of his hand. And he feels he's doing pretty good. When Jesus spoke to his disciples, he used parables. Why did he not want everyone to understand his message? Well, basically, he usually explained the parables if the disciples didn't understand it. It was the non-believers that he did not want to understand it. Why? It was not meant for them to at that time. Why? They weren't ready. Um, You have to take into consideration the miracles and everything that he was performing, and many people were worshiping him not because of the miracle that he was the son of God, but because he could create a fish sandwich. Okay. You don't want to convert somebody that would just think he was the creator of a fish sandwich. They're not ready. Got it? Okay, Pastor Murray, this was Gene from Illinois. I enjoy so much watching your, thank you. My question is, did the serpent in the Garden of Eden talk like a human or are we supposed to imagine this? Thank you. No, no, no. You need to, you need to check it out in the Word of God. Who was the serpent in the garden? Well, it's one of Satan's names. Read Revelation chapter 12, verse 6 and 7, or go to Revelation chapter 20 and read verses 2, 3, and 4, uh, 2 and 3. And you will find that the serpent, that old dragon who is the devil, that's just, it's Satan. Okay. The most beautiful of the cherubims, he was a looker, a knockout. He was called a serpent because of his wicked ways. Um, and here we have Gail from Connecticut. Uh, New Year's Eve, I've seen, I've seen where birds have dropped dead, mostly red-winged blackbirds. Was this significance? And do you believe God is true? No, it was a, we had terrible thunderstorms here. And <clears throat> when you're sucked up into it, we, we had tornadoes that killed three people down south of here, near where the birds were killed. <clears throat> those, those thunderstorms were violent, vicious that night. And naturally, these birds died from trauma, meaning that hail and wind killed the birds, the whole flock. Blackbirds migrate in groups through here this time of the year. And unfortunately, they got in the wrong place at the right time, and the storm spit them out. May from Michigan. Don't, don't believe this stuff that fireworks frighten them. We don't, it is not our practice to fire off that many fireworks at uh, New Year's. Okay. It was fireworks, all right. It was fireworks from God, a thunderstorm. May from Michigan. I wanted to ask you, since mankind have always been so disobedient and destructive, will there ever be flesh after the millennium, or will there be sp- no flesh after the millennium? Once we're through, once the seventh trump sounds, all flesh is, cha- even animal flesh, is changed to spiritual bodies. No more flesh. And, and, and remember also, it's a different dimension. And, and maybe you can see into it a little better. CM from Georgia. I have a question, Pastor. The Bible states that tanks and guns will be melted into plowshares and pruning hooks. Will we be farming during the millennium or living on welfare? Well, we, we will not be living on welfare. We will put to use what God gives us to use. Julie from Ohio. What does the Bible say about uh, being a long distance member of a church? I love your ministry and I have not found another that is compatible, that is local. Is it okay to only study on TV and not to physically attend? Well, we, we are spiritually in attendance. We are a church. And when you study God's word with us, you're in church. So distance means nothing to our Father. And we have these miracles of television, the airways, the ether waves that uh, let us commune one with the other spiritually and otherwise. And uh, so 
you're, you're at home, you're welcome, and you, you study his word and be blessed. Uh, Joseph from Arkansas, I want a full robe in heaven and not short shorts. Well, that's a good outlook. So my question to you is, my helping support Shepherd's Chapel is this righteous acts. It sure is. Do you realize how many people you reach by doing that? And it is the people that keep this, make this possible. It reaches and changes lives every day. Not man and not even Shepherd's Chapel, but the Word of God through the chapel. The shepherd, of course, is the Lord Jesus Christ. If anybody wants to join this church, you've got to take it up with him. And if he approves you, if the head shepherd, that's Christ, approves you, you're in. You're in church. Uh, okay, question. Charlie from Illinois, can you tell me where in the Bible that it states that more fallen angels came after the flood? Well, it was, that was Og, but go take your companion Bible and go to Appendix 25, and it tells you all about the Nephilim, that's the fallen ones, that's the Hebrew word meaning the fallen angels, and, and the giants, the Geber, that would come, and it will, you'll learn probably more than you ever wanted to know about them there. Dan from North Carolina. If we are separated by the gulf in paradise, haven't we been judged to a degree at that point? Oh, no, not judged, but determined from the book of life. I mean, your name is written there, and what you have done determines not by judgment, but by your own actions, which side of the gulf you go on. Um, I'll say that again. When they open the book, when you get there, and we're by your name, if it says you're a fantastic person, right over here. If it says there you didn't give a hoot for nothing, you're going over there, okay? It's what's written in your book, and only you decide that, okay? And it's not, not time for God's judgment. Uh, you, we, uh, I think most people will be glad that God does not judge them at that time, but waits until the great white throne ju judgment because they've got the whole millennium to get their act together, maybe. Judy from Texas, please answer this. I have wanted to serve God all of my life, but I was very abused by those who were supposed to be my family, and I do not believe they were good souls but very dark ones. Um, you know, uh, you um, don't, don't always blame your shortcomings on others. You're a bigger person than that. You're a daughter of the living God. E even if you were abused, you stand up and you let God know he can use you. That um, He'll take care of those that abused you. You don't have to worry about it. And, and um, do what is right, and you will uh, be serving God then. But you can't serve God and blame all your shortcomings on other people. That will not fly with our Father. You've got to fess up and do what's right, cut your own, own wake, and you'll be just fine. Bill from Canada. What will our spiritual body be like? Will we be transparent and will we eat and sleep? Or what, what will we be doing? Well, we're, we're going to be happy for one thing because you're away from a flesh body that's painful and, and, um, and ages and gets ill, that in itself. But it's in a different dimension. It is not transparent. It's very visible. Even someone in the transition of dying can see into that dimension. It is not transparent. And, um, um, and it is, it's what we all work forward to. We can trust God for that. And it is not the corruption that we have in flesh world with Satan being the prince of darkness and having free run where he is, when people allow it, Christians allow it but a safe place. God takes care of his own. Pat from California, you have said that you cannot have salvation in the flesh. Please explain. Whoa, whoa, whoa. 
you're leaving most of the teaching off. I said, if you premeditate murder and you lie in wait just because you're a wicked rascal with no reason whatsoever, no jealousy, no reason just to kill and take a life, then you cannot have salvation in the flesh. It's quoted in the first epistle of John chapter 3, verse 15. Uh, but that's only for a murderer. Anyone else can have salvation in the flesh. And I'm not saying that God will not let them have salvation in the spiritual body if things, if God so chooses, that's his business. Pat, but he said, send them up to me. I'll take care of them. That's where their real trial takes place. Uh, Pat from California. Uh, I'll, I'll use an example. The uh, character that just snuffed six lives in Arizona. They're going to give him a trial here, but his main trial is up there with the father. Boy, will he get it there. Pat from California. My understanding of the three world ages is the first earth age before the flood, second earth age, present time, third earth age, the millennium. Eh, you're not quite right, okay? The first earth age was before the katabo, not the flood of Noah, if that's what you're thinking. It was long before that. And the second earth age is this present time. But the third earth age is after the millennium. The millennium is part of this earth age, uh, meaning the earth will not be changed until the end of the millennium. People will be changed, but the earth, Eret, will not be changed until the end of the millennium. Uh, Revelation 21, Pat from California, are we living now because we, don't, we didn't make the cut in the first earth age? No. God's elect are living now, and they are here because God chose them there to stand against Satan. He knows they have the ability to stand against Satan. He knows he can trust them to accomplish what must be done. You see, he depends on the elect to be the voice by Christ speaking through them against the false Christ. And many of the people... There were not all that many that, were, that found salvation. Why? There wasn't a Savior in the first earth age. People were people, and some went bad, and some were in between, and some didn't care. But there were a few of God's elect that earned the right before the foundations of this world. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, plus many other places. I chose you before the foundations of this world. So, but... Um, basically, all in all, many followed him then, and they're following him now, the false one, in deception. They don't know any better. Why? They will not study God's Word chapter by chapter and verse by verse. That's real sad. I'm not judging anyone. I mean, look around you. Uh, talk to them. Ask one of them, what saith the Lord? And... <laughs> <laughs> You'll have all kinds of answers, all right. Uh, duh, will be one of the main ones you'll hear. Lily from California. Uh, since I've been watching your program on television, I have decided to tie 10% of my income to you, Pastor. And um, I truly enjoy your teaching. Thank you so very much. Well, Thank you very much. We, we appreciate it. That's welcome aboard. Uh, Joe from Texas. I am 52 years old. I've been watching your program for a long time, and I understand what you are saying, but since I can't read, will I go to hell? Absolutely not. Nowhere in God's Word is salvation connected with the ability to read. Okay. And quite frankly, we show the wording at the bottom of the screen as the scripture so that you can, when I read it, you can follow along so that you know I'm not lying to you. I'm giving the true manuscript word, okay? And therefore, um, you are heaven bound if you love him. Uh, what, what does John 3.16 say? God so loved the world he gave his only begotten son that whomsoever would believe 
didn't say whomsoever could read. Whomsoever would believe upon him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You're a believer, Joe. You hang tough. Get going, partner. I know you can stand against the false Christ. You're not the one that has to read and speak against him. Christ's going to use your lips, your mouth. He's going to give you wisdom. We read it today. Hang tough, partner. Kathleen from, Kathleen from Georgia. I'm sorry, I believe that's California. What is the Companion Bible? The Companion Bible is a King James Version Bible. It was put together by uh, a, a gentleman and his staff named Bullinger, who was probably one of the better scholars. He was one of the only Christians that Ginsburg allowed to proofread the manuscripts of the Masora. That's pretty tall cotton when you know what you're talking about, okay? But it has appendix, and it uses the word, it outlines the word, and when you outline the word, it helps you better understand how to enjoy and how to study the Bible. I think it's a fantastic Bible, and that's why I highly recommend it. I'm out of time. Hey, I love you all because you enjoy our Father's Word. Most of all, God loves you for it. Hey, it makes His day. It makes His day when you read the letter He's written to you. Because as God's elect, He uses you. You. That's what I said. And uh, make his day. Boy, is he going to make yours. We're brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, bless him. He will always, I do mean always, bless you. Most important, though, you listen to me. You listen good. You stay in his word every day. In his word is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? Because Jesus, Yeshua, is the living word. Hearing God.